So, hello everyone. Thank you for coming today uh, to this talk. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Adrian Baez. Adrian got a degree in computer science at the University of La Laguna. Then he moved to the UK to develop a PhD at the University of Cambridge under the advice of Dr. Liz Marchinson in the field of transmissible cancers. Two years ago, he moved to the Sanger Institute in Cambridge to carry out a postdoc in the field of somatic evolution of normal tissues under the advice of Dr. Peter Campbell, Dr. Mike Stratton, and uh, Dr. Inigo Martin Corena. Today he's presenting his last work that uh, is a cover of the journal Nature this week. Uh, thank you, John, for coming and uh, hope you enjoy the, call, the, the talk. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jose, for that uh, appropriately short introduction. Um, so, Jose asked me to say a bit about myself before I go into this. Um, so, as he said, I come from from Tenerife, or Tenerife, for Spanish people. Now, so is this this is a serving suggestion? This is what we call the Sea of Clouds. So, it's, uh, there's a lot more island underneath. So, I I did my undergraduate degree in Tenerife, my masters in Tenerife, um, in computer science, and I was. Um, trying to find a niche to apply computer science to actual science and to do something more research related than development related. And then I met this, this really bizarre, quite insane chap called Jose Tubio. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so, so he helped me to, to to find a group in Cambridge to do my, my PhD. And that was the group of um, Liz Marchison. And this group studies transmissible cancers, which are cancers that can infect animals and spread as parasites. Um, and she studies two of these cancers, one in Tasmania and there was the other one in dogs. Um, my PhD was about uh, basically the lower quadrant of this drawing, which is studying the evolution of the the oldest known transmissible cancer, which is in dogs. And then after my PhD, I moved to the Sanger Institute, um, to the Martin Corena group. And this is a very different, um, how do you say? It's a it was a very different side of um, somatic mutation research. So before I was studying a cancer that was a very long-lived um, entity. And here we are looking at individual cells in normal tissues which haven't developed um, cancer yet and we are trying to see how the mutations that happen in those cells contribute to diseases which are not cancer which is what we really don't understand yet so what we do is to explore different tissues of the human body and address the challenges of finding mutations in individual cells um, in relation especially to aging and to not very well diseases which are non-malignant and the reason why we are with we think this could be a promising thing to study is because of the fact that we are molecular mosaics so we start to develop from a single cell and by the time we are born we have billions of cells and we end up having trillions of cells and during this process these cells diverge slightly from each other so the dna you were probably told the DNA of all your cells is identical, but actually the DNA of every cell is unique. So each cell carries unique changes from the DNA that you inherited from your parents. And over time, these changes define families of cells or tribes of cells, which we call clones. And especially in tissues which are flat, which are epithelial, you can study, you can detect those clones using the mutation. So you can see that there are families of cells which are descended from a single stem cell because they have a mutation which is shared by them, which happen in the stem cell. And you can see how these clones um, develop as we age. 
and the development of these clones is influenced by by mutagenic exposure. So exposures to external agents or factors of your environment, factors of your lifestyle. And we are trying to understand how this influences um, both aging and disease. But um, so this is what this is what our group does in general. And normally every person has a different tissue. Um, so people tend to study tissues in humans that have never been studied before. But in this project, we tried to do the opposite. We took a tissue that had already been studied in humans, and we tried to study it in a, in a different species. Um, so this is a very unique project, even in, in our institute. Um, so this project was initiated about five years ago by this postdoc called Alex Kagan, who is also a professional science illustrator. So all the illustrations in here, they were hand-drawn by him. So he thought about making this project to study variation in somatic mutation across mammals. And then later on, when the project was fully in shape, so we knew what we were going to study, I joined, when I joined the Institute two years ago, I helped him to finish this project um, and, to, and to basically find the conclusions of the project and what it means. And, and in the end, the, the result was that we ended up being uh, co-authors in this article, which came out in print uh, yesterday at 4 p.m. And it's this, um, you got this, this very nice cover of the journal that Alex drew himself as well. And so we're trying to order a poster of this for him. Um, so anyway, so this was the project that Alex conceived and then I helped him to, to finalize it. And the idea, the idea that really drawn him to to put this project together was a series of questions, scientific questions that were well known. The first question arises from the observation that different species age at different speeds. So, so not all species live the same. It's, uh, very obvious. So then the problem is what. Um, we, we understand what kind of uh, evolutionary process has led to the speed of aging. So we know why different, why different species age at different rates, as in, as in what is the reason this has evolved? And it's, it's basically because selection is not strong enough to favor mechanisms which prolong the lifespan longer than the species, than the animal needs to live. So if a mouse is going to live one year in, in the wild on average, then the mouse body won't have the mechanisms to preserve itself for 10, 20 years because there's no advantage in that. So we understand how aging works from the evolutionary, why aging happens, but we don't really understand how aging happens or what are the mechanisms of aging. And the main question that we're trying to address is whether somatic mutations contribute to the aging process. And in the long term, we want to know exactly to what extent and which other processes are important. And in order to see this, we need to compare the different species and we need to check whether the mutation rate in different species is actually different or if it's the same. And if we see differences in the mutation rate, um, in order to see if they're associated with the lifespan of the species, we need to see whether they correlate. So we also need estimates of the lifespan of each species, which are very hard to, to, to derive, to produce. And the second question is also a very interesting observation, which is called Pitos paradox um, from, from an epidemiologist in the UK. And he noticed, I think in the 70s, that the risk of cancer in different species is independent of the size of the animal, which is very paradoxical because the more cells you have, if, if your chance of getting cancer is equal to the chance of one of your stem cells becoming malignant, then the more stem cells your body has, the more chance you have of getting cancer. So by theoretical prediction, if it's up to the number of cells, every blue whale should die of colon cancer by the age of 25, but they don't. And on the, for the same reason, no mouse should ever develop cancer because they're too small and they live too little. So this is not what we see. When we see cancer incidence rates, the, the curve of cancer incidence against age, the three curves are almost identical for mouse, for human, and for whales. So there is an evolutionary mechanism which controls cancer risk across species. Um, so the question is, 
what is this mechanism? And one possibility is that species have adjusted their somatic mutation rate. So the, the speed at which the cells in the body acquire new mutations so that the, they compensate for differences in body size so that the cancer risk is the same in different species. And this will be a very elegant way of doing it. So you only have to change one thing, the mutation rate. Um, and that would solve the whole problem, but nobody actually knows um, whether this is true. And in that case, it's not only about whether the differences in mutation rate correlate with differences in lifespan, but you also have to take into account body mass. So if the main determinant of mutation rate is cancer risk, then the variation in mutation rates will be explained by differences in body size. So larger species will have lower mutation rates for the same, if they have the same lifespan as other species. If it's mainly determined by aging, then species of the same size, but different lifespans will have different mutation rates. So we need to find a set of species where we can explore this. And also, we, we, we had to find, it was very important to find the ideal tissue to study across mammals um, in a way that would be very robust. And we decided to study colonic crypts in, in, all the, in a number of mammalian species. Colonic crypts are this uh, sort of uh, folds that line the, the inside. So there is the internal mm -hmm. epithelium of the, of the large intestine. It falls into, this, into these invaginations, and each one of them is called a crypt. But when I talk, uh, when I talk about crypts, I will be talking about those little faults. Um, so one advantage is these faults happen in all mammals. So you can identify them on the microscope, and they are very visible, and you can isolate them and, and look at them independently. And another very big advantage is that those grips are actually um, they're actually independent um, units. So it's what we call a it's, a it's a clonal structure. So each of those grips it has a stem cell at the bottom. It actually has multiple stem cells, but only one of them proliferates. And that stem cell at the bottom mm, it replicates and it produces differentiated cells or partly differentiated cells such that the whole crypt is derived from a single cell. So when you cut the whole crypt and you sequence it, you are, sequenced, you are sequencing the amplified DNA of the stem cell. So the mutations you see on the crypt will be the mutations that happen in the stem cell. So that's why, that's why we were interested in crypts because it's what we call a clonal unit. So the whole crypt is like a family. So when you, when you isolate it, you see the mutations in the common ancestor, which is the stem cell. So what Alex did is he established a lot of collaborations with a number of zoos, with, uh, with the cetacean stranding um, program, with the Natural History Museum and groups in, in Cambridge. And he put together this collection of 16 human species. So he, he managed to get people to send him large intestine from all these species. Um, so his 16 species, the most uh, exotic ones are colobus, which is a type of monkey you have ferret. Um, however, porpoise is the smallest species of cetacean. Uh, we have ring-tailed lemur, and the most, probably the most distinctive one is the naked mole rat, which is a rodent, which is the size of a mouse, but it lives 30, 35 years, and it uh, almost never gets cancer. So it's a very unusual species, and it's one of these species which uh, it seems like it lives too long for its size. So it was, we we wanted to get something like that. And it's also a model of uh, studies in aging and in cancer. Um, so the only thing is we couldn't find any that sequencing data from the previous study we had at the Sangro. Of human colonic groups, which are processed with the same protocol, sequenced with the same in technology, but they're completely comparable with the, the study of human colon. And how this works is when the, when the animal dies in a zoo, you get this uh, sample collected within 24 hours because the colon degrades very quickly. And it gets put in vaccine fixative, and then it gets preparated into slides. Um, one of the slides is used for histology, and we identify the groups.
very thing and very long. But they are not as long as you would imagine. You know, a giraffe is much larger than a rat, but the crypts are not this large. <laughs> so anyway, so we could identify what a colonic crypt is in every species with just advantage. And then we had to find a way of cutting that crypt and sequencing it. So we are sequencing the stem cells. And we do this with this machine called the laser capture microscope, which is very cool. Excuse me, so, Adrian. So, um, uh, we cannot see your presentation uh, online. Microscope. And it's Will because it has a laser inside. So there's a laser that goes down the lens. And you can actually see it. It's extremely small, but you can you can see it by eye. And what, what we do is we put the slide upside down. So actually the sample, the sample doesn't have a glass on it. So the sample is actually a slime there. You put it upside down, and then you cut you, you cut it with a laser. The laser cuts the tissue, doesn't cut the glass, and then the tissue starts to fall by gravity. And at some point, normally, it, it doesn't fall completely, so it sort of tries to hang there, or it jumps and it hangs somewhere else. And you have to use the laser to push it into the well. So each of these scripts were cut by laser, thrown into a different well, and sequenced individually as individual samples. Really? Excuse, excuse me, Adrian. We cannot see your sure. presentation for the ones that we are online. Could you share it again, please? It must happen some filer in the Sorry, connection. In the presentation. Maybe that is. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We can see it now. Uh, should, should I go back one slide or? Yes, please. Sure. Yeah. Um, So I was saying we I'm trying to make this to work. So with this laser microscope to process the um, to cut the individual crypts. Um, basically we put the sample upside down, the laser cuts through the sample, not through the glass, and then the sample falls into an individual well in a 96 well plate. And then we use a protease protocol to to digest the tissue, and then we we have a special protocol where we can sequence DNA from about 300, 500 cells, which is what a crypt, what a cut of a crypt will have, or maybe definitely less than a thousand. Um, and I made this um, example quite recently. So this was some mouse heart muscle I was cutting. So it's, um, how you say, um, cardiomyocytes, <laughs> myocardium. So, so these are very. Uh, we, we wouldn't cut this this piece. It's very it's very ugly looking. But this was an example. So, if you want to cut something very precisely with a laser microscope, you can mark it on. So it comes with a software. You tell the microscope where you want the laser to go, and you choose the intensity of the laser, the focus of the laser, and so on. And then you let the laser follow what you trace. And it's very very precise. So we can cut all kinds of structures. Um, and the idea is that we can isolate cell types. This is what we're doing at the moment. At the moment, we want to get a number of different cell types from mouse. Um, so the microscope allows you to go very precise. You can get different, different, um, as in different structures within the same tissue. So you will see that the tissue starts to fall into the well by gravity, but it, it almost always stays stuck to the plate. But sometimes it doesn't. And then you have to change the intensity of the laser and, and sort of push it into the plate. So we'll behave. And then if you are feeling really cool that day, which is what Alex used to cut the column crypts, uh, you also have this this sort of, uh, I shouldn't be like that. You have this sort of touch screen where you're going to use a pen to use the laser in real time. And that's a bit of liver. It shouldn't be that way. There's a bit of liver being cut and falling into the well by hand. So this is, what we, this is how we normally cut crypts. We don't actually draw them with a, it's too much work. So we just get the pen and we cut them. So, so basically Alex did, did this hundreds of times and each time you have to get a picture before and after so you can check whether if there's a problem afterwards you need to know which crypt it was. So this is how it looks like. So you, in the end you have these samples with lots of gaps where the crypts used to be. And in total, Alex probably cut something like 500 or, or maybe more than 500 individual crypts. But in the end, the ones that work for the study were these ones. So we had a set of 208 colonic crypts from 56 animals from 16 species of mammals. And you can also see, so the number of crypts per species 
is very variable depending how many animals we can get. For some species, we could only get one. And here you can have the you can see the range of ages of these animals. So we have from mice which are younger than a year, so I think the lemur is almost 27 years old. Um, and for instance, the porpoise, we didn't have an age for it because it was a stranding. And since we didn't have an age, we couldn't actually do much with it in terms of mutation rate because we don't know how old it is. So anyway, so this was our data set. Um, and then the first thing we wanted to do was to identify somatic mutations reliably in these colonic cribs. So these are mutations which happen in the crib. They are not shared by the rest of the animal. They only happen in the stem cell that gave rise to that crib. Um, and this is the part where I joined the project. And now the presentation turns extremely boring and much uglier than before because we lose all the, all the illustrations and the animation. So the first thing I had to do, which it, it, it took uh, a lot of time, it was filtering the variant calls, which if anyone has worked with variant calls here, it knows how, how dirty they are when they come out of the program. So we had this caveman variant caller, which we used at the Sanger, mm -hmm. and he has a very high false positive rate. So we had to implement that series of 12 filters to, to filter these variants and get high confidence. So we get basically high quality, high confidence somatic mutations. I'm not going to go into this, obviously. But basically, the types of mutations we studied were single base substitutions, which are the usual, is the somatic equivalent of a SNP. So it's a change where there is a difference on one nucleotide between the reference sequence and the sequence you're studying. And then we also studied indels, which are short insertions and deletions. And this example, for instance, is an insertion of two Cs into the sequence. And when you compare, so we, we compare the sequence we obtain from the sample to the reference genome. And we only look for these two kinds of differences. Well, we, we did a bit more than that, but it's not so interesting. So these were the, the core of the study, especially the single base substitutions. So a lot of the time, if I talk about mutations, I mean the first type substitutions, because they are the most frequent ones. Um, so the first thing we did was basically to see <coughs> how many mutations each creep had. And there we saw a lot of variability. So these are number of mutations per whole genome, so per, per stem cell. And you can see a lot of variation within the same species. Um, but that's obviously because um, all the animals have different ages. Um, and it's known that mutations happen over time. So the, more you, the longer you live, the more mutations you will have. It has been seen, we have seen in humans that in every tissue we study in humans, Somatic mutations accumulate linearly with time. So it's a constant accumulation. So it's like a straight line against age. And the first thing we show is that this translates to other species as well. So for the species where we had at least three individuals, we could draw a straight line. If you had two individuals, you can always draw a straight line. So it was very reassuring because it shows the mutations that we have are probably highly accurate because of the fact they fall on a straight line against age. And you can see there's a lot of variation between animals, even if they have the same age. So each color is a different animal. And also, the regression was compatible with uh, a number of zero mutations at the beginning at age zero, which is what we were expecting. So when you are born, you are not expected to have any mutations in your cribs. And if you see a lot of mutations at age zero, it means there is a problem, probably. There is a problem with the with our method, not with not with you. So anyway, so that's the first thing we showed that somatic mutations are constant in other species, not just in humans. And then we looked at it um, with a high resolution into substitutions to look at which processes causes substitutions across species and whether they are shared or they are different. So for this, we took the single base substitutions where you replace one nucleotide, and we categorized this based on the type of substitution, so the type of base change, and also the context of it. So we take the base before and the base after, and we form a trinucleotide. And if you combine all the possible trinucleotides and all the possible types of nucleotide change, then you have 96 mutation types. And this is uh, the standard in our field is to arrange this in this plot, where you have 96 bars. The color is just which type of substitution it was. 
So this, the red one will be cytosynthesizing, timing to adenine and so on. And on the bottom, you have the context where it happened. And this, spec, this, this is what we call the mutation of spectrum. And the spectrum is never, it's almost never flat. So some mutation types dominate. So here you can see some bars are very high and some bars are very low. So this is normal. The thing is which bars are high and which bars are low tells you which molecular processes are operating on the genome to produce those mutations because each process has its own fingerprint or its own signature. So when we did this across species, these are the spectra we find. So you can see the human one matched the human one from the previous study because it was the same samples as well. Um, but it's what we were expecting. So the advantage we had with colon is that we know what we are expecting to find. And if we have some problem with our data, it's not going to look like that. So we have a very good quality control because we know how they should look like. So the spectrum is dominated by cytosine to thymine, which are the red mutations. And they're very high up at four specific places. And then you can see the shape is roughly the same across mammals. So it's not completely different. So the same, the same processes seem to operate. But you can see there are some differences. A so mouse has a lot of cytosine to, add, to adenine, ferret as well, cow as well. And then some species have a lot of uh, sort of a background noise across all the spectrum. So you can see rat is very noisy. Uh, rabbit is very noisy. So there are these three types of spectra, I think. So as for instance, horse is very clean and it's very similar to human. So there are these sort of three types of spectra. And in the end, we applied a statistical approach to decompose this spectra into the essential patterns which you can combine to make this, this, this result. So we decompose them. Mm -hmm. um, the patterns you, you decompose it into are called mutational signatures. And each one of them tends to correspond to one molecular process. So we found this whole variation across mammals was explained by three processes or three signatures. The first signature is very well known. It's, it, it's a signature of uh, spontaneous deamination of 5-methyl cytosine. These are cytosine bases with a, they get methylated. And after that, they can get deaminated and they spontaneously convert to thymines. And this is, a, this is a very well known process. So it happens uh, constantly. So it happens constantly in time. So it's a, what we call a clock-like process. So you can more or less predict what age a person is from the number of these mutations. And it's, we have found this process in, I think, probably every cell type in the human body. And certainly most animals we have ever looked at and all the cancer types. It's just how much of it there is that is different. So it's a spontaneous process that happens in all cells. And it's just very normal. It's very boring. Then the second one is this flat signature, which was this background noise I was talking about. And we think this corresponds to a signature that is known in cancers. Uh, we call it signature five. But here, because it's not exactly the same, we call it signature B. And this is, we think this is a combination of processes which uh, cause DNA damage and also repair DNA damage. So it's not just one process. It's, it's, it's a pattern that is left from many processes which we don't really understand working together, uh, both to damage to some processes to cause damage to the genome and some other processes to detect that damage and compensate for it. So it's basically the bug of all the things we don't know about how the DNA damage works. So that's where all the all the rest is. So we know it's not a single process. We don't know which processes it is. We can we have some guesses. And we know it's also constant in time and it's endogenous and it happens in all cells. And then the third signature was more special. So this is the signature of uh, oxidative DNA damage. So it's damaged by reactive oxygen species, like the like the sort of compounds that are produced inside the mitochondria, which are very toxic to DNA. Um, it seems this, um, this is a signature that dominates the colon in some species. And we don't really understand why those why some species have this process more than other ones. So it doesn't correlate with diet or anything like that. And it doesn't correlate with type of mammal or anything like that. But with these three with these three patterns, you can reconstruct the patterns of each species. So we think these three processes are the ones operating in mammals in the colon. Um, the point is they don't operate to the same extent in every species. So then we estimated the amount of activity of each of those three ones in every species. And you can see things which are consistent with the plots I showed before. So mouse has a lot of the purple one is the third one. 
So mouse and ferret have a lot of oxidative damage. Human has a lot of cytosine deamination, which is the first signature. And then you have cow, rat, and rabbit, which have this sort of dirty spectrum. And they are dominated by the second signature, which is all this background DNA damage noise, which we haven't yet decomposed into processes. And something else we show is that each of those processes is also linear in time. So even though different species have different fractions of mutations from each process, each process correlates linearly with age, which we didn't expect to find. And so here you can see the, the difference in the, the, the way different processes will contribute to the number of mutations a person has at age 60 or 80. Um, but the fact that they were all linear was, was, was a bit surprising. So this is about um, so how the mutations look like and what the processes behind are. And then we started to look into the rate, so the speed at which the mutations happen. So we tried to look at mutation rates and how they correlate with biological traits that distinguish different species of mammals. So the first thing, you remember I showed this, and I said different animals in the same species, they have very different numbers of mutations, but it's because they have a different age. So the older ones have more mutations. So the first thing we do is to divide by the animal age. Mm -hmm. So we divide by the individual age, and instead of mutations per genome, we have the mutation rate in mutations per genome per year. And I looks very different. So within a species, it tends to be flatter than before, but you see huge differences between species here still. So, so we remove part of the variance within the species because it was caused by differences in age. And now we don't understand what, what is causing the difference between mouse and human, for instance. So we see different species have very different mutation rates. And now we want to understand which other things which vary between species correlate with this variation. So there could be possible explanations for it. So we went to a, a few databases and through the literature, and we collected estimates of these five, um, how would you say, life history variables, which are basically biological and ecological <laughs> traits of the species. So we look at adult body mass because we're interested in Pitot's paradox and cancer risk. We look at metabolic rate because there is this idea that, you know, mice age faster because they live faster and they have a faster heartbeat and they just use more energy and so they wear out faster. So that's called the speed of life theory and we, and we wanted to see if that was true if this is true then the basal metabolic rate which is the metabolic rate of the animal when it's not doing anything it will correlate with the mutation rate if that's the explanation then with the liter size um well, just because it was there i think um the liter size correlates with lots of things so larger animals have less offspring smaller <laughs> animals have larger offspring um and then with the longevity so maximum longevity um, we, we tried maximum longevity and, and you can do it, but the problem is that it's based on anecdotes. So it's like I had a rat which lived in seven years and a half. Okay, so it doesn't really, it's not quantitative, so it's not empirical. So we wanted an estimate of lifespan, <laughs> so the lifespan in captivity of a species, which is empirical. So you can say 80% of the animals of the species live this long if you put them on a cage. So this is an example of what people think different species live, <clears throat> how long they live. But this is based on, well, reports of zoos and estimates of biologists. And so there are individual reports from individual animals. So we don't know how well, how representative they are. And if you take estimates from different species, so the human one will be very accurate because we know a lot about humans. And the one about ferrets, who knows? So we wanted to have something more quantitative. So we partner with this consortium called Species 360, which is a, which is a, is sort of a, is a collection of zoos that contribute their data. And we couldn't actually release this data because it's still private, but they allowed us to share this result. So we took 37,000 mortality records from zoos <laughs> and we drew a survival curves like you do in medicine. <laughs> Um, we had to exclude basically deaths before maturity, which don't contribute to the lifespan. And since maturity, you have this death curve, and it varies a lot between species. And you can see in some species, like in rat, so the curve falls very, very nicely. And then you have those six annoying rats that always won't die. 
and nobody really knows whether those are true or not. It could be that somebody wrote the, the wrong year on it or the wrong month. And then you have a massive outlier that is biasing all your data. So yeah, I think in the case of the rat, it's likely to be a, a problem with the record, for instance. Um, so in order to protect against this, we chose 80% lifespan as a conservative estimate. So this is the lifespan of 80% of the, of the cohort of the species. And for humans, because we didn't have human zoos, Alex uh, found these three human censuses from, from the north of Europe uh, of people, I think, born in 1912. So it's a whole cohort of people followed through their lives. And it shows you the mortality of a human population. And they look very, very similar between those three countries. Um, so we use this to estimate, basically, we got the best, the most precise estimates of lifespan that have ever been derived, because no one has this amount of data from SUS. So that is very important to have very accurate mutation rate estimates and very accurate lifespan estimates. A mass is very easy to get accurate mass estimates. Um, so then once we have the lifespan, we can see whether the easiest thing you can do is to estimate how many mutations the animal will have by the time is it, it will probably die if, it, if it's in captivity. So we call this a mutation burden at the end of lifespan. So we take the mutation rate in mutations per year, and we multiply by the lifespan in years, and we have the end, uh, end of lifespan burden. And you see how the whole thing flattens out. So once you account for differences in lifespan, the mutation rate per year, the differences sort of cancel. Because the, the species with the highest rate, they live less than the species with the lower rate. And in the end, they, 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 they form kind of a line. And if you, if you, if you take a look at how, how different the species of mammals are in terms of life history traits, it's even more impressive because you have the 16 species, they have a difference, they have a whole range of body mass. So they vary in body mass by a factor of 40,000. So I think this is giraffe, um, giraffe and mouse. So a giraffe is 40,000 times heavier than a mouse. And in terms of lifespan, there's a 30 fold difference in lifespan. So it's a, it's a difference by a factor of 30 between maximum and minimum. If we look at mutation rate, there's still a big difference between mice and humans. So it's a, it's a difference by a factor of 17. But if you look at the mutation burden, the number of mutations at the end of lifespan, the variation is by a factor of three. And if you're students of biology, you will know there are very few things in biology that vary by a factor of two or three. Like a uh, height varies by a factor of two, even within one species. So to have something across species that varies by a factor of three is quite narrow for biology. So, so it, it was very striking given the diversity of the life history traits, how constrained the, the mutation burden was. So th this is basically, we interpret this as a signal that the the mutation rate is under evolutionary constraint. So evolution has tuned the mutation rate so that the different species have a similar number of mutations by the time they die. The number itself doesn't really matter so much because it will be different in different tissues. So we wanted to explore this idea that uh, the reason for the variance that we observe in mutation rates is because evolution is trying to keep the mutation burden constant. So that the species will, well, to, to match the lifespan of the species, basically. So in order to see, in order to see whether this was reliable, we used the mixed effects linear models, which are very complicated linear regression models. And we tried these four variables that I mentioned to see whether how how well each of them explain differences in mutation rate and whether the combinations of them were better than either of them alone. So to see what biological variance explains this pattern we see. So the, the simplest model you can imagine if you want to model mutation rate as given by dictated by lifespan, which is what we suspected, is you assume this model where the mutation rate is the life is the is some number that the species have at the end of their lifespan, which is the, this, this burden I was talking about, you divide it by the lifespan and you get the mutation rate. That's the simplest model we were assuming. 
So let's assume the mutation rate is constant, the number is always the same across species and so on. Mm -hmm. And that corresponds to a linear regression where you regress mutation rate against one over lifespan, the opposite of lifespan. So if the lifespan is 10, one over lifespan is 0 0.1. So you correlate against that. And that is pretty much the simplest model you can use for lifespan. And it only takes lifespan into account. It doesn't take any other variable. And it gave us this figure. Um, this figure, it looks like a banana because the correlation is in one over lifespan, but the plot shows lifespan because it's easier to interpret. So then the curve is a one over X. So basically for this, for this very diverse set of species, we found that lifespan by itself, assuming constant mutation rate, it, exp it, um, it explains a lot of the variation. So the, if you see the, the, the faint blue bands around the line, there's a twofold difference in the, in the regression line. And the regression line basically marks um, the point where the K is. And that K is the average number of mutations by the end of lifespan in all the species. So the average across mammals. And that's more or less 3,200 mutations per colony crib. But obviously, there's this threefold difference between species. So basically, the line marks that value. The blue bands, the outer blue bands, mark a twofold difference, so half as much, twice as much. And no species crosses the line. So no species varies from the average more than twofold, which uh, we didn't see for any other variable. Um, so you can see this model would be quite able to predict mutation rate from lifespan, for instance, except so, so, so cat is a bit strange, for instance. Um, and then the, the way we measure whether the model works or not is we measure how much of the variance in mutation rate between species, not inside these species, between different species, is explained by the model. And this is what we call the FBE, which means fraction of interspecies variance explained, which we which is a term we invented. But if you do simple linear regression, is what you call R squared. But because this model is more complicated, you cannot just call it R squared mm -hmm. because it's not the same thing. But it's equivalent. So it's how much of that variation we observe in our plots is explained by this model. And it's 82% for this one. And then we said, okay, so lifespan by itself, assuming the simplest model is 82%. What if we try mass? So mass, the simplest model is to say, well, the mass varies so much, it's, it's a 40,000 factor difference. So we have to take the log of the mass. So it has a better scale. And here you see it doesn't work as well. So the, the fraction of variance explained is 44%. And you can see the one that really breaks the, breaks the pattern is the naked mole rat, because the, um, yeah, the naked mole rat is very small, but it, lives, but it has a very, low mutation rate and you expect the rest of the species if they are very small they have a very high mutation rate and the naked mole rat is sort of the outlier and that's why we, we thought it was very important to get naked mole rat because they are not representative of rodents they are very special species like bats but bats are very strange mammals as well so what we saw is that mass by itself doesn't explain our data so well and then we tried the other variables. And it's also important to combine variables and see. So if you have lifespan and you put mass on top, does the model improve? Mm -hmm. So this is what, I, what we summarize here. So then we have the other variables. We have liter size, the log of the basal metabolic rate. Um, and the residuals is something to basically adjust the metabolic rate by the size of the animal. But it's basically an adjusted metabolic rate. So the light blue bar shows how much of the variance each variable explains by itself. So you have 82% for lifespan, 44% for body size, and the other ones don't really improve on that. And then once you put each of them with lifespan, the model doesn't really get much better. It doesn't really get significantly better than lifespan on its own. So there's no second variable you can add to lifespan that improves the model. But if you add lifespan to any other variable, so you go from, you are in here and you add lifespan, then you get as good as the lifespan model. So it means that um, it gives us this signal that lifespan is dominating the, the explanatory, the, the um, lifespan is dominating the signal that we see. So now the variable gets close, no other variable improves the model. But then we had an extra concern, which is 
you know, you are you are combining lifespan and mass, but lifespan and mass are not independent, which is which is a big criticism of life history studies. So the different variables are correlated with each other. So it's very well known that larger species live longer. So maybe we are seeing the effect. You know, maybe lifespan works very well, but it's actually mass that is working under the hood, you know, under the table. And we are not being able to see it because our measurements are not very good or something like that. Or, or for some other reason, because maybe we shouldn't be transforming the mass for, for the log. So we wanted to see whether if we accounted for variation in one of these two. So we imagine you, you can correct longevity for differences in mass. So once you once you normalize the species for mass, then how much does the change in lifespan and the other way around? So you account for the correlation. And we, for this, we use a thing called partial correlation analysis, which is uh, well, I probably shouldn't explain it. It's, it's not as it's, it's not very difficult to do. So basically, what you do is a regression between two variables where you account for the effect of a third variable that is outside the model. So in this case, you want to correlate mutation rate. You want to regress mutation rate on lifespan as before, but you want to correct both variables for differences in body size. So you want to take into account that bigger species mm -hmm. live longer and bigger species seem to have lower mutation rates because otherwise it's a triple correlation. So, um, so once we do that, so we take into account the effect of mass and we get this sort of uh, adjusted residuals. And what we find is the correlation is still there. So there is a straight line going between mutation rate and lifespan, well, not, not just lifespan, but the number you get from lifespan once you correct for the body mass. And the correlation is very strong. It, it even looks better than before. <laughs> and the, the amazing thing is the fraction of variance explained is exactly the same. So it doesn't really, this model is as good as the other one, is what I'm saying. And then you can do the opposite. You take, instead of lifespan, you take body size, you take mutation rate, and you correct both for differences in lifespan. And you see whether you get a strong correlation or not. Um, suspense. So we get no correlation. So it's, so it's not significant at all. So it, it's almost a circle. So this, this, was, this was even more strange than we expected. So we expected to find some sort of pattern that wasn't as good as the other one. But what we see is that we saw some effect, uh, you know, we saw a model with lifespan can explain 44% of the variance in mutation rate. But once you correct both variables for, for lifespan, so did I say like a model with body mass by itself explains 44% of the variance. If you account for differences in lifespan, it explains nothing. So well, the fraction of variance explained is, is basically zero. So it seems that body mass doesn't contribute anything on top of lifespan, whether, whereas lifespan seems to, the, the correlation seems to be still there, even if you account for differences in body size. So that's why, for instance, the naked mole rat is very important because the naked mole rat, if you remember the plot, is a very small animal, but it has a very low mutation rate because even though it's very small, it lives very long. So it fits with the model that lifespan is what determines is what explains the mutation rate and not body mass. And that's why those species that don't fit the line are very important. And so, so basically we took, we, we did a few more analysis. So we took this to indicate that lifespan is the best explanation for differences in mutation rate. There might be other variables that explain it, but what we are saying is lifespan is the one that dominates and body size doesn't seem to have an effect. So, so in conclusion, we have similar mutational processes in the column, although they operate at different extents between species. We have that species have similar mutation burdens at the end of their lifespan, even though they have massive variances in other variables. And this suggests that the somatic mutation rates are evolutionarily controlled in order to make these numbers stay fairly similar across species. Um, and then we thought, so why? So is it because of cancer risk? Is it because of aging? Is it because of something else? So what we found is there's a very strong anti-correlation with lifespan. So inverse correlation with the inverse of lifespan, which is consistent with a model where with a model where different species 
have their mutation rates adjusted so they all have the same burden at the end. And we found that all the other variables we consider, once you correct for lifespan, they don't really explain anything. So everything they explain can be explained by lifespan as well. And then this analysis of body mass, the conclusion of it is that because body mass is not the main determinant of mutation rate, we conclude that Pito's paradox, the fact that different species of different sizes have similar cancer rates, is not explained by differences in mutation rates alone. So there has to be some other mechanism that has evolved to control cancer risk beyond somatic mutation rates. So for instance, it's known that elephants have extra copies of TP53, although it's a bit controversial. So it seems they have duplicated the gene and that would make the cell less susceptible to cancer. And probably whales have other probably whales have other adaptations to large body size that we haven't discovered. But the thing is all these species became very large independently. So elephants and whales, their ancestor was, was not a large animal. So they have independent evolution of large size. And evolution does not necessarily choose the same answer to the same mm -hmm. question all the time. So each of those species will probably have different adaptations to solve Peter's paradox. But this, this sort of elegant solution, which was let's change the mutation rate so we don't get cancer, it doesn't seem to be what happens in, in nature, or at least in mammals. And then the question is, so does this mean somatic mutations contribute to aging, which is what everyone wants to know? Um, and the thing is, we have discovered a correlation between somatic mutation rates and lifespan or inverse lifespan, but we don't know in which, so what is causing the correlation? You don't know if the, the somatic mutation rate is dictating the lifespan, which would mean mutations <laughs> cause aging, or you don't know if the lifespan has come from somewhere else, like the life history of the species and the ecology of the species, and the mutation rate is adapting to track the lifespan. So it's not a cause of lifespan. And there is also the possibility there's a third variable outside like um, DNA damage. So DNA damage causes somatic mutations and DNA damage could cause aging. So you will have a correlation between both things. So it's, it's not really solved that somatic mutations cause aging. We suspect that the fact that they are so tightly correlated with lifespan means they have a role to play in aging or they are a proxy, they are a there are a signal that there is something related to with DNA damage that has something to do with aging. But the important thing to note is that aging, when we say well, DNA damage causes aging, which is what people will tell you, the thing is DNA damage is, is not just one thing and aging is not just one thing. So aging is many things. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a multitude of phenotypes, which has a multitude of causes. So I think what we have to do in the future is really we we won't really solve aging by treating it as, as a single thing so the idea is that we need to identify phenotypes of aging so things that we associate with old people so what how when you call someone old why do you know that person is old those are the phenotypes of aging and you want to see mm -hmm. whether different types of dna damage and dna repair which are completely independent from each other have anything to say for those ones so for instance we think there is some evidence that nucleotide excision repair is involved in, in progeria and progeroid syndromes, which are accelerated aging syndromes, which are horrible. But mismatch repair, which is the third one, it, it doesn't seem to influence aging. So there are people who are deficient for mismatch repair and they have a massive mutation rate of those types of mutations and they don't age any faster. They have very high cancer rates, but they don't age, they don't have accelerated aging. So we have a multitude of processes going on and we, we need to split aging into dimensions and, and not treat it as, as, a, as a single thing that has a single solution or, or a single cause. Um, well, just when I wanted to show all the people who have worked on this. So Alex Kagan is really the creator of the study. The, the person who put the project together, got the samples, got them, he painted the cover for nature for free, uh, many other things. And Inigo is the, the one who has been supporting the project, um, is um, providing the funding and so on. And then there are lots of people on the Sangha which have helped with, especially with the samples. And then we have all these collaborators which have 
given us access to this very unique collection of, of mammals. Um, so I think I'll stop here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. There's this, so, so that was before I joined actually. So it was obvious that we needed the study to be realistic. So we need to select something that was similar to humans and we couldn't just do all animals or anything like that. So mammals was the obvious thing to try because it's the next thing beyond humans. And they also, if you do just primates, they're all too similar. So the species, they were chosen to maximize diversity. So to maximize difference in lifespan, differences in size, and sometimes differences in other things as well, like whether they have, you know, the way that their diets, because we expected the diet to have an effect on the mutation patterns, which it didn't have. Um, so we wanted to select the mammals to be as different as possible, but we also needed to have reference genomes for all of them. We needed to be able to get ages for all of them. So if we have no age, we can't do anything. Um, and it depends on what the collaborators could offer as well. So for instance, we couldn't get elephants because elephants live so long that they never die. So, <laughs> so we, could, we, we cannot just go and kill an elephant. We need to be opportunistic. So we need to wait until an animal dies. So the people in the zoos, they were in touch with Alex. And whenever they, some lion died, then they, they send him some column, but they don't just kill the lion to get the column, obviously. So it was very constrained by which animals died. Um, but for the naked mole rat, it was different because they had to say it was it's a colony that they have in the university. And sometimes they had to sacrifice them because they're studying something to do with naked mole rats. And they tend to be young ones. As in, they don't tend to be the 30 year old naked mole rats. Um, so those ones, if they had to sacrifice them for their own research, then they will give us a bit of column. So it depended a lot on what was available. Um, it was very important to our reference genomes as well. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Wonderful talk. Uh, do all, uh, all these animals have the same mitotic activity in the pits? As in the division rate? Yeah, the division rate. That's a good question. Um, the thing is, no, nobody has estimates of uh, it's very different. It's, it's very difficult because there are different cell types in the crib, which are all it's all a clone. But you know, you have the stem cell, then you have the, um, the transient amplifying progenitors, and then you have these goblet cells, and then you have the differentiated cells on the top, and the differentiated cells on the right, obviously. But it seems that in humans, at least, it seems that it's just the cell division rate is different in different parts of the crib. And um, outside of humans, there are a couple of estimates for mice. I think for humans, there are two estimates which are completely different. So we couldn't really do much because one of the criticism is, uh, one criticism could be maybe what changes with lifespan is the cell division rate and your mutations just depend on cell division. But we know we know these processes, they're not really division, the, the processes we found in the column, they're not really division, they're not replication errors. So they shouldn't be division dependent. But more important, uh, well, we had estimates for human and for mouse. So what we could show is that the difference between human and mouse division rates, it would need to be much larger than it is to, to explain for 17 fold differences in mutation rate. So there is a difference, but it might be four or five times faster in the mouse, maybe, or something like that. But it doesn't really, the problem is we couldn't say because outside mice and humans, we didn't find any data on division rates in the column. And there's also this problem. We don't know whether there are division rates of stem cells. So it was we couldn't really answer, but we had the feeling it doesn't the variation we know it doesn't explain the pattern. But it's possible. But in any case, you said at the beginning that the cell that is mutated is the stem cell. Yes. So once you get the mutation, 
It doesn't matter the, 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 the mitotic rate. No, you, you it, are a... What matters is the mitotic rate of that stem cell. Okay. So yeah. if, if, if the mutations come from replication errors or somehow they become fixed at replication, then, well, it could happen even if they are not replication errors. If they are lesions, the amount, the rate at which those lesions become mutations will depend on the mutation rate, on, on, on the division rate, sorry. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the things we don't have the estimates yeah, well. but it could be there is a, it's not impossible that it could be the mutation right we just couldn't see it in the data we had which is, it was three data points so uh, that was one of the criticisms we had hi this is very well uh, small question are the elephants that you said something that it was um, controversial. Yeah, it was. Um, is that? They have extra focus on TP53, maybe? Yes, yes. So TP53 uh, is the is the most famous tumor suppressor gene. And we have two copies. And normally, in many cancers, two, the two copies are mutated in some way. Um, so, an easy way to decrease cancer risk would be to get three copies. So we're much harder for the cells. So we had this supplementary discussion where we try to model very, very simply how much does getting an extra tumor suppressor gene compensate? What is the equivalent in mutation rate decrease from for getting an extra gene? And it was something like extra. Well, like I can't say it off my top of my head, but it was something like getting an extra copy of a tumor suppressor gene is as effective as cutting your mutation rate in half or something like that and it's, it sounds cheaper as well genomically speaking but uh, in elephants there are this sort of it's a bit controversial but it's in they seem to have 20 copies of tp53 and then other people wrote that many of those copies were pseudogenes <laughs> so it's not clear how many they have but uh, elephants must have a mechanism to defend against cancer and it doesn't look i mean we don't have elephants here but it doesn't look from this pattern that it's going to be just mutation rate and it also seems like it would be very inefficient because you need to decrease the mutation rate in every cell, whereas getting one copy of a couple of, of it doesn't have to be extra genes, could be a different measure, it could be much cheaper in terms of, um, you know, in terms of evolution. Actually, TP53 is not a classical tumor suppressor. Sometimes it's, it's it an takes as a oncogen as well. So I think it's both. It depends so more copies of TP53 could be good, but maybe mutation that activates the gene in the way that it behaves about an oncogene is not good. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, what about TP53 in stem cells? Yeah. I, I wonder. I don't know. Um, yeah, those ones would only need to happen in one copy, that's the idea. Um, so I don't, I don't know. It well, doesn't have to, it, anyway. I mean, no, what I mean is that uh, TP53 is what has been found in elephants. And that's what I mean. It's very controversial whether that's true. But we, what we model is what is the equivalent. So what is, what is, what is the effect in cancer risk of getting an extra tumor suppressor gene versus having your, cutting your mutation rate by a factor X. And we saw that both of them work. So you can, you can change them. You can change cancer risk a lot. By doing either thing, but uh, it seems well. First, we don't see the mutation rate behaving in that way, and it seems it would be much cheaper to duplicate the gene than to than to than to control the mutation rate all the time in all the cells, or at least in some cells, which is what matters. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you for the talking. I was wondering, uh, you have found this uh, triple variation in somatic mutation rate. Would you expect uh, a similar uh, amount of variation for the same species at the German? Uh, I mean, uh, yes, yes, there is. There is a difference. I'm not sure if it's the same difference. <laughs> there is a, there is an anti-correlation of germline mutation rates with lifespan in species as well. And the other, I think probably the strongest criticism people would make um, because we send the paper around to lots of people that were not reviewers just to see what they thought and and uh, the people who study journal mutation rates they see that a similar correlation exists but it's more dependent on effective population size so that seems to be what mm -hmm. determines how low the mutation rate can get in the 
I mean, in the germline. Um, but basically, the, an alternative explanation could be that what is under pressure is the germline mutation rate, and the somatic mutation rate is just times, you know, ten times the mutation, the germline mutation rate always, and therefore it gives rise to this pattern. But the pattern is not actually real; it's just the germline, and the somatic is just a number of times higher. That is a fixed number, and we came up with a number of caveats. So I mean. The thing is, those some those mutational processes, they don't really operate in the germline except for, I mean, they don't operate exactly like that. The third process doesn't exist in the germline. Then you have this thing. The total mutation rate it follows lifespan, but different species, the contributions of those processes are, are very different between species. So you have mice with all this C2A, the cytosine to adenine, and then you have humans with all this C2T, and it doesn't seem to matter. So it doesn't seem to be, there is the same processes just scaled by 10. So the different species have different mutation rates per process, but the total mutation rate follows lifespan. And you wouldn't expect that if it's the germline is doing, because the germline doesn't even have oxidative that much, as far as I know. So it's not, it's that the mutational processes are different. And you don't see that the mutational processes explain the correlation by themselves, but it's the total. So I think those are, probably the biggest arguments. And also different tissues in humans have different mutation rates. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when you uh, estimate the DNA by the mutational burden, that's for one term of population. So that would be the number of mutations that are accumulated in just one case. Yes. So that the expanded to all the you can expand to all the testing for example well, that would be the, the number of mutations in each one of the kids. In each so one. But the uh, we have on average around five per animal. So so Alex cut lots of them, but many of them don't they, they, they don't yield DNA. Or then when you cut them you find out there are two clones inside and not one, or either is two cribs. Or the crib has two stem cells, and then we can't do anything because we have twice the mutation. It, 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 it breaks everything. So we needed to make sure they were clonal. But on average, we had around five per animal. So we are, and we see a variance inside each animal. So our model had to be very complicated because you have mammals. They are different species. Each species have a has a mutation rate, but there's also variance between animals. Each animal has a mutation rate on average, but it also varies between crypts. So the model has to take all that into account because the crypts are not independent data points. Um, so that's why I always talk about the variance between species because there's variance inside this, each species and inside each animal. So each crypt is a little bit different. Hola. 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 I think the stress of taking part in the study or the stress of of the life in the zoo, you mean? Yeah, one, one question we have is whether these animals represent wild animals, I think whether they are representative of the species. Um, for the for the zoos, we think they are because they are, I mean, they are as wild as they can get. The food is not the same, I assume. They're probably overfed. Um, the, the major problem that we have is that the, the mice and the, the mice and the rats, they are laboratory mice and laboratory rats, and, and they could be completely different from wild mice. And there is actually, there, is, there are some papers saying there is more oxidative damage in laboratory mice than in wild mice. And there is also wild mice live longer, but these are just papers that you don't know whether you, I don't know how, how true they are, but there are papers saying well, that is normal. Laboratory mice do live less than any laboratory animal lives less than a wild animal that you put in a cage. And um, whether they have more oxidative damage is, is possible. I'm not sure if it's because of stress, because these mice are not very stressed, actually. They're, they're probably extremely bored. Um, but this is the point also with, for the zoos, I wouldn't be very concerned. Um, 
but there is also this question, you know, whether they have any problems in the zoos that, because they don't move around as much, and whether they represent the animal in its real environment. Um, I don't know, but the, the only wild animal we have is a porpoise, and we couldn't use it because we don't know the age. That's the problem with wild animals. So the only alternative is to get a wild animal, have it have offspring, and then raise those offsprings, and wait until they die if you don't want to kill them. And that takes depends on the species. It could take uh, your entire career. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the best data set we can. There are problems with using data from zoos for lifespan. Maybe that's not entirely. So there are problems with uh, whether the animals are representative of the actual mammals. But I don't think there is a better model than these animals. Well, maybe the lab mice. Well, we can't get mice in any zoo, so. They have... so it's... I would like to ask you the same question. So regarding the selection of species and considering that there are some commercial ones, the commercial ones have a lesser um, variability mm. rather than humans or the wild species. And this might affect the data from the location rate. Um, you mean the, lab, the, the laboratory ones? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they are probably very, they are very inbred, actually. We were trying to do a copy number and we couldn't get any snips on the mice because they are completely, they're all brothers and sisters. Um, and they're very, very inbred. So there is a possibility. Also the lifespan, the thing is the lifespan we have for mouse and for rat, they are laboratory mouse and laboratory mm -hmm. mice. So in theory, it should be correct. <laughs> but there is, I, I do, I, I wouldn't be surprised, for instance, the, in our data, we have the rats have a lower lifespan than mice. And I don't believe a rat in the wild will have a, you know, an actual rat lives less than an actual mouse because it's just much larger and much nastier. So I'm not sure, is that the mice are the perfect prey? Um, so I, I'm not convinced those data are completely representative and they're very important because the mice and the, they're set up outliers because they live very little, but um, is the thing is we can't really get more quality data because we cannot have outbreak mice with ages that we could find. It was very opportunistic as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very, the regression can be influenced a lot by those three species. So we try to account for that with the structure of the model that um, for instance, also, we had a lot of mice and a lot of rats, as in samples, because we had a lot. So that could make the line go straight through through mouse and rat, and it fits the model because that's where the data are. So that's what the model, when the model says we have 16 species with this many animals, with this many crypts, it tries to give, it's a way of giving the species equal weight. And something else we did as well to see if it was true is we took the average per species so we do the average mutation rate per animal than the average in the species, and we do single points. And then the difference in samples between species goes away, and we see whether we get the same thing. And then we always try taking out mouse and rat, and the line does move. So there is, um, well, I never show one over lifespan, but it's a line. And if you put mouse and rat, it, it, it does move the line because they're at the end. Um, but, I, but it doesn't really break that this model is the best model. But yeah, I can, I, I, one of the biggest problems is the mouse and the rat are very important and they are not, they are not entirely representative of wild animals. And these lifespans are also not representative of the lifespans of real mice and rats. Uh, but that's the, that's the thing. If we don't get mouse and rat, there's no animal in there that lives so little that we can get. So that was, that was one of the main things. Yeah. So we're very concerned making sure those species were good. Mm. This one. Um, this is the relation between the DNA different 
not I think the activity of each pathway might depend on the cell cycle on, on, on that cell type if they have a different amount of damage. But the, basically, each pathway has evolved to identify and repair one particular type of damage. And for instance, glucotad excision repair has probably, probably evolved in bacteria just to fix UV damage. So we have you have these proteins. The only thing they can do is recognize UV damage, and they won't recognize any other kind of damage. So they evolve. If, if there was no UV, we wouldn't have a nucleotide excision repair, probably. And then base excision repair is very messy. So it's not one. It's one pathway, but at the beginning it has, I think, 12 proteins, and each of those 12 proteins recognizes one type of lesion from one one base modification, and it will only detect that. And then the rest of the pathway sort of fix fix. They detect them and detects the lesion and removes the base. And if you have a problem with one of those proteins, then you can correct that type of specific base change. Um, so they are they are independent, and I think they are independently evolved. I think. Yeah. 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 For, for instance, uh, mismatch repair, the function of mismatch repair is to fix replication errors of polymerase when it replicates the genome. So errors in nucleotide incorporation. So in cells that don't cycle, like neurons, th there's no need for mismatch repair because there's, no, um, there's never a mismatch because the DNA is never replicated. So presumably that pathway doesn't do anything there. I'm not sure if it's now, maybe it does something else. And the pathways also, they sort of conflict with each other, depend on each other. So there are papers where they try to improve base excision repair by overexpressing one of these proteins. And instead of do, instead of getting that, they destroyed mismatch repair and, and the cell had a much higher mutation rate because it's, it's a really complicated button network of something like 400 genes. So they, sort, they, they do interact, so there are these master regulators of DNA repair, but each of the pathways is completely different. And each of those types of damage, they have a different effect on the cell. So if you have, you know, these bulky lesions on DNA, if they happen on genes, then the cell cannot actually transcribe the gene. And when it tries to transcribe, it needs to recruit this pathway that only works in transcription to get the lesion and get it out of the way. But if that doesn't happen in a gene, then there's no problem. So it's uh, it's very it's very very complicated. It's not just it's not just mutations. There are all these there are all these types of processes, um, and some of them will be important in some conditions and not in others. I think. I'm Actually, not sure. There's no questions online. Any other questions in the, the room? Okay. I have just one last question. So. Uh, in the case Alex is thinking about uh, extending this study to other animal species, which kind of tissue is he going mm -hmm. to That's very complicated. It's, it's very tricky. So it depends on the... So Alex wants to do this on reptiles, birds, insects, mollusks, probably plants, um, and some of these unicellular. Mm, well, I'm not sure that's going to work. Um, so basically, across the tree of life, but obviously not all the species, it's just species which are interesting, for instance, ants are very interesting because you have workers and, and you have casts, and the casts have different lifespan, but they are genetically the same. Then in bees, you have haploid diploid. So do the haploid males get twice the mutation rate or half the mutation rate, how it works? So there are species which are interesting on themselves. So it's going to be much more interesting than this. So each species how, is a little... How is, how is he going to... Estimate the, the, the age of uh, ants. Well, the, you can you can buy them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to set up a little colony. Then we want to do Drosophila because it's obvious. It's quite easy. So at the moment we are piloting insects, but it's very hard. We have to use a different technology because you don't just do that. You don't do laser on this kind of fish. issues. It depends, and so for uh, it's very so for for each type of animal is different. So for birds, it will be quite easy. So we can do five or three or four tissues. So we want these tissues that divide, tissues that don't divide, things like that. For Drosophila, we would like, uh, for instance, muscle and gut. 
use muscle doesn't divide and gut is one of the few tissues that divides but it's very hard to do the dissection so for each uh, you need a it's very it's very complicated because you cannot just fix you can't do histology with insects or if anyone knows how to do histology with insects come talk to me um so it's very it's each 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 of those branches has its own problems and it's very so we want to choose tissues which can be organs which can be found in all of those species from insects eh? so even if it's just brain muscle gut and um, and something else and maybe gone up so that would be an act that would be, that would be really cool um but it's it's not even it's not even i'm not even sure whether one piece of insect will have enough mutations to do anything with it so it's very uh, it's very uncertain but uh, we will have to go for more tissues at least one, more than one tissue per so for 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 bibles he wanted to at least put because it was the obvious thing that they all have um and then you suggested probably himalaya something like that but they all the thing is we don't even have what mutation we don't know what mutation rate they have so creeps were very obvious because they have a very high mutation rate so they were good now we we are going in blind so we have no idea what to expect um, with these animals Nice story. Okay, thank you, thank you so much for coming, and thank you everybody for attending. Thank you.